Welcome to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network, a show that streams health, happiness, and hope to the kidney community. You can download all Kidney Talk shows from iTunes and find a variety of resources to help you navigate this illness at rsnhope.org. Please welcome your host, Lori Hartwell, who has lived with kidney disease since the age of two. I am so excited because today we're going to be talking to Chris Klug, who's a pro snowboarder. He was the first ever transplant recipient to win the bronze medal and did it four months after a liver transplant. I can't even imagine that. And we also have David Fleming, who's the president and CEO of Donate Life America. So welcome to the show, guys. You bet. Thanks for having us on. I was really interested to learn that every 10, well, I know this. Um, I've had four transplants, and I had my fourth transplant about two years ago, and I have spent my whole life either waiting or enjoying a transplant. (laughs) So, you know, I don't think the public knows that every 10 minutes, another person is added to the waiting list for an organ transplant. But a new survey shows that even though many people are in favor of organ donation, they aren't registering, which just, I find it difficult to believe. Yeah, the need is, uh, as you highlighted, the need is great. Uh, There's, uh, as we all know, over 115,000 people today waiting for solid organ transplants across our country. David and I have teamed up with Estellas today to help get the word out there and encourage uh, everybody uh, during uh, Donate Life Month in April to uh, know the facts about donation, share that decision with their family, and ultimately uh, designate that through the state registries. And I really encourage people not to wait for, uh, until you've got to renew or, or get your license for the first time. Well, Chris, reading your story was, you know, so fascinating. I remember when you had your transplant. I watched you compete in the Olympics. It was just such a breakthrough for all transplant recipients. Like, we were so proud, you know, because, you know, a lot of people think, I have this saying, you know, well, our kidneys failed, maybe our brain failed at the same time. You know, they have this interpretation. And um, tell us what it was like for you when you knew you needed a, a transplant. And, you know, how do you prepare for that? And how did it impact your family? Well, I found out through a routine physical in the early 90s. I was informed that I had high liver enzymes, and I didn't know what a liver enzyme was or if that was a good thing or a bad thing at the time. And about a year and a half later, we found out that it was a disease called PSC that uh, was a life-threatening disease and would one day require a liver transplant. And I'll never forget when I found out, I was looking around the room thinking to myself, who in the heck are they talking to? They can't be talking to me. I'm you know, perfectly healthy and active and I've got an Olympics coming up. They can't be talking about me. Right. And uh, I was in denial for quite a while until actually uh, the death of one of my boyhood heroes and and football greats, Walter Payton, who died uh, from cancer as a result of PSC. I think that's when the disease became real for me. And then I was really determined to to beat it, to uh, do everything I could uh, in training for what I called the race for my life, physically and mentally, to overcome it and and demonstrate that... uh, my, my Olympic dreams weren't dead and that I could bounce back and, and uh, still compete at a high level and, and achieve my dreams. Well, what's interesting about, you know, when you need a kidney transplant or you need a liver transplant or a heart, to my understanding is, you know, when you ha- need a kidney transplant, you have dialysis to sustain your life. So people can be on the wait list for 10, 12, 15. I was, you know, it, it's, it's amazing. But, but when you need a liver transplant, there is no life-saving mechanism. And, I mean, that mortality right in, the, in your face must be just, it, it's overwhelming even when you need a, a kidney transplant. But to come to terms that if I don't get a liver, I'm not going to be here. Yeah, I was running out of time. My health was deteriorating quickly. And uh, in the spring and, and summer of 2000, after being on the waiting list for almost six years and about three months at a more critical stage, you know, I was wondering if I was going to die on the waiting list. And that's a scary place to be. Uh, that I'm healthier and stronger than ever after my transplant, and that those folks that are that are going through the same thing I did almost 13 years ago, they can bounce back strong too. Mm-hmm. Doesn't mean that you know there won't be a few bumps in the road potentially, but uh, I like helping show what's possible. Well, it's amazing because I know with other heart and liver transplants, you have to get so sick to get a transplant, which seems kind of you know counterintuitive because you want to be as healthy as possible to get a transplant but that's how this list works this national waiting list for organ donation you know there's over 120,000 people waiting so they have to kind of prioritize who needs them the fastest so that's why we got our work cut out for us we got to encourage everybody to uh, say yes to donation and, and designate their decision today 
I, and I would put a huge dent in the waiting list and avoid, you know, the 6,500 people that are dying today uh, waiting for transplants. And, you know, when I talk to some of my friends, they also feel very guilty. Like, you know, I'm waiting for somebody to pass away so I can get the gift of life. It's a very tormenting thought. And, you know, I try to explain to them is that you have no control over that. You know, that person, you know, his fate was <laughs> sealed in some way. You know, you hate to say that, but you're not responsible for it. And I think a lot of the donor community who's received organs feel guilty, like, oh, my goodness, I have to wait. But I've seen people who've donated families' organs, and it just decreases the, you know, um, grievement time because you you know that, um, you know, your person you love is, is living on. And so, yeah, it's just fascinating. And what's interesting is when I got my third transplant, I had waited. I'd spent all my teenagers on dialysis. And interestingly, um, the person who ended up being the deceased donor was in his mid-20s. He was a perfect match, and he was an accident in Denver, Colorado. And I got that kidney, and that kidney worked for 20 years. It was the best kidney. And I called, of course, Denver because it came from Denver. And every time I signed onto my computer, I had a picture of Denver. So I would never forget. So you're part person. Colorado? I am. I, I have. I have a male kidney. I can use the male restroom legally. I mean, there's a lot of benefits to... You um, must be a heck of a snowboarder then, being uh, part Colorado. I, you know, I actually, I went skiing in, when I was 20 years old. Um, I went with one of my, you know, friends I was dating. And you'll appreciate this, never skied in my life. Went down the bunny hill of Squaw Valley twice, then went over to the bar to, like, hang out. And then the mountain was closing. They're like, we'll take the gondola down. And this guy I was dating convinced me to ski down Squaw Valley Mountain. And it took me about an hour and 15 minutes to ski down that mountain, which is the longest ski run in the country, right? And you made it. I made it. But I think that was probably enough skiing for me for a while. (laughs) It scared me pretty bad. Well, David, tell us about this survey that you just recently completed and what you've learned of why people, you know, aren't you know, signing up to be an organ donor. Sure. One of the things that the survey that we conducted with Estellas confirmed for us is that, you know, support for organ, eye, and tissue donation and transplantation remains very high in the United States. Unfortunately, what it also reinforced is that Americans are still procrastinating this decision to register to be a donor. Um, As you and Chris just talked about, you know, we have almost 120,000 people waiting for life-saving transplants. 6,500 people are dying every year waiting. Um, And yet, support for donation is very high. Uh, So our challenge is to cut through the clutter, uh, to convince Americans to stop procrastinating, making an official decision about something that they already support. And one of the other things that the survey also told us is that hearing from people like you and Chris that have been personally affected by donation and transplantation um, is the the best way to motivate people uh, to get through this procrastination, to cut the clutter take a couple of minutes out of their day to register online to be a donor. You know, the survey also talked about some of the myths and misconceptions um, that are commonly held uh, with regard to donation and transplantation. The good news is it seems like people are not holding on to those myths and misconceptions as strongly as in the past, uh, but we certainly do still see people fighting with things like it's against my religion, though all major religions support donation and transplantation. Um, And the real clear message we want to get across to the American public, um, and we're just thankful to have Chris and Estella helping us get this message out, is that you don't have to wait till your next driver's license transaction. You can do it today. You can do it online by simply going to donatelife.net, click on the register button to find out how to register in your state. And we really don't want people to put it off. Uh, You don't want to wait until you have that tragic, unexpected moment to have this conversation. You want to do it um, in the comfort of your own home, as Chris says. Well, you know, one of the things I hear all the time, and it's like, well, they won't save me if I go to the emergency room because they want my organs. And, you know, I'm like, trust me, they're not that organized. (laughs) Um, You know, it's not like one, one place is talking to another place. And the goal of the emergency room is to save you. The organ procurement and the donate life you know, it's totally different. It's not even part of that. And the goal of the hospital is always to save you. So, I mean, that's one. Do you hear that one a lot? Uh, We hear that one a lot. And that's one of those uh, things that 
that we hear when you're talking to someone and um, they kind of whisper in your ear, yeah, but are they really going to try as hard to save you if they know you're a donor? I mean, I support donation, but are they really going to try as hard? And that comes from my friends that know I've been doing this for 15 years and they support donation, but it's this very cynical, latent mistrust of the system. Unfortunately, I think our friends in Hollywood furthered that myth for a long time. They're doing a much better job of portraying it accurately, but there were a number of shows, particularly back in the 80s, um, that did not portray donation and transplantation accurately when it comes to that particular myth and misconception. But that's one of the things we fight. And to your point, we want to make sure people know that the medical teams that are trying to save your life in an emergency situation are completely separate from transplant and recovery teams, and that donation is only considered uh, when everything has been done to try and save your life. And, you know, really it's, it's viewed as we're trying to give an opportunity to the family and to this donor to do something in the midst of tragedy, to do something that's going to save somebody's life, somebody just like one of us, somebody just like Chris Klug. I know. It is. It's fascinating. When I had my, my first and second transplant, my first one was at 13, and it was a deceased donor, and it was back in the 70s, and it didn't work. And then I had a second in the early 80s, which, you know, the medical technology is just amazing, but that transplant didn't work. And I was 18 years old and was told I would never have a transplant. And so I decided just to go about my day. I had a beeper and it, you know, shorted out on one of the water rides. And so, you know, they never thought I would get another transplant. And I got a call in 1990 with a perfect match kidney. And I can't even tell you, I mean, that was over 20 plus years ago, and I've accomplished so much helping others and have dedicated my life to helping people with kidney disease. But that one simple act of this person and their family who selfishly decided to give the gift of life totally transformed my life like it did yours. And I think until you're touched with organ donation like that, it's so difficult to comprehend because people don't like to even think about their own mortality. <laughs> I mean, you know, like this isn't going to happen to me, and which of course is a natural, you know, feeling because we think we're indestructible. But Chris, you and I know that that's not true anymore, right? <laughs> we are. We are. I like to still think so, but well, when you go to the to the transplant center and you know you get your labs drawn, and just from that moment, from when you get your labs drawn, and then you get the sheet faxed to you or emailed to you, and you look at it and everything's normal, you're like oh my goodness, this is, I mean, it's just a sense of joy that I can't even comprehend. It's the first time in my life that I have been normal in every single lab with my transplant, which to me, I mean, I've never been normal. Everything is normal. And I, I, I don't even think people understand that I had a transplant on Friday and the following Monday, my labs were normal which just makes me even want to tear up. Um, That's incredible. Congratulations. It's incredible. I mean, you know, I have a 0.8 creatinine, which I like to brag about. So um, one of the things that shows up on Facebook a lot, and I hope that this has been, you know, squashed, but I think it really plays into the younger generation that, you know, they go to Vegas and they end up in a hotel room in a tub of ice with a, a cell phone by them and their kidneys removed. And, you know, we hear this, you know, periodically it pops up on our forums or, and, you know, I'm like, I'm like, my question is, you don't wake up in a tub of ice. <laughs> so first of all, <laughs> that is, you know, ridiculous. But how do these urban legends, I mean, you know, they keep popping up of different things that are, keep to prevent people from, oh, I just have a little bit of doubt about going to sign up to be an organ donor. Yeah, fortunately, we don't hear that one very much anymore. Well, that's good. <laughs> because there's never been any kind of documented case um, similar to that. It's just, it truly is urban legend. And, and once again, some of that is fostered by Hollywood. Um, you know, of course, anything that is seen on television, of course, must be true. Must be true. Um, so that's one of the things that we try to deal with through efforts at Donate Life Hollywood, trying to inspire accurate storytelling, particularly when it comes to um, portrayal of medical stories. Um, but, you know, one of the unfortunate things about the human race is that we tend to get very creative when we get bored. Um, so that's one of the things that we certainly work very hard to do is to try and make sure that, particularly in medical drama kind of situations, that they're treating it. It can be fantastic. It can be exciting without being wrong. Uh, so we want to make sure that 
you know, there's plenty of excitement to go around when it comes to donation and transplantation, uh, but we want to make sure that they are accurately telling stories um, so that we're not misleading the public, particularly a public that gets a lot of their information from uh, dramatic series as opposed to actual news. Well, and then, you know, it's really um, exciting for people who need a kidney transplant, and this was probably falling over into other organs, is that, you know, they're taking extended criteria kidneys, which is allowing seniors to donate. So, uh, you know, I, enc- I encounter a lot of people, well, I'm too old to donate. And that's not true, correct? Right. And that's one of the primary myths out there. Something else we're trying to deal with is that everyone should consider themselves a donor. Um, there is no one too old. Uh, to be a donor, we want to make sure that people aren't self-selecting themselves out of donation because of some pre-existing medical condition or because of their age. Um, so that's a very important piece of information for us to get out there, particularly particularly with an aging population as we see a higher and higher percentage of the population over the age of 50. Well, I call myself the queen of parts because I've had, you know, double knee replacements, a hip and four kidneys. And I'm like, you know, there's got to be something good they can use. So, uh, you know, I, I'm sure I could donate something. Um, a surgeon told me once that I have good skin to cut on, so I'm sure the skin is good. Um, so, you know, I mean, that I, he meant that as the utmost comp- com- compliment. But uh, from all the surgeries I've had, it's like I never have any problems with surgery. And I think it's because of the fact. And I think people don't realize when they're talking about organ donation, there's also tissue, there's eyes, there's, you know, burn victims. There's a lot of things that can be utilized to help somebody else, you know, live their life. I mean, you can't take your organs to heaven. I mean, you might as well help somebody else who's here and, you know, encourage them. So please uh, tell people what they can do, you know, what, after they listen to this show, um, what do they need to do and how can they help get the word out? Well, the absolute most important thing they can do to provide hope to the patients waiting is to register that decision to be a donor. Go to DonateLife.net. If you haven't done so already, click on the register button, register in your state. And then, of course, we want to make sure that people are sharing that decision with their family members and encouraging their family members and their friends to also register and provide hope for the patients waiting uh, that are so dependent on the generosity um, of donors and donor families to save their lives. Um, And to not procrastinate it. You know, don't put it off till tomorrow. If you're inspired to do it today, do it today. Well, and, you know, it may end up saving your life. I mean, my kidney failure was caused from the E. coli bacteria. Um, You know, I never thought, I I don't have any genetic illness or anything. I just ate a bad hamburger. And that caused my kidney failure. And so the person who's signing up to donate to give the gift of life to somebody else may be the one in turn who's going to get the gift. And you just never know. And I've heard this about, you know, family members and their child needs a transplant. And, you know, don't wait now because there may be a loved one in the future who needs the generosity of others. Chris, anything you want to add? Uh, I would just say, uh, you know, twofold. Obviously, encourage everybody to, uh, as David said, um, you know, visit their their state registries and, and go on there and register if they haven't already. And uh, to know that transplants work, that... Uh, Transplant recipients are out there winning Olympic medals now, and it's uh, it's mainstream medicine. And uh, as a transplant recipient uh, like you, I'm I'm so grateful for my second chance, and, and happy to be here. And isn't it amazing? Well, Chris, um, to wrap up the show, uh, tell us what you're up to, and you know how fast you're skiing now, and any skiing tips for people in the community that you know want to win a medal in the Olympics. Well, I'm uh, after. You know, 20 years on the circuit and uh, three Winter Olympics. I'm happy to be home full time in Aspen, not living out of a suitcase. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a new father. I've got a little two year old little girl and another one on the way this oh, fall. Wow. And, uh, you know, still, still uh, loving riding my snowboard and, and pushing myself athletically with uh, different mountaineering and, and cycling activities and uh, showing what's possible after a transplant. Well, that's amazing. I mean, you know, you have a family, you're living your life, and it's because somebody decided to be a donor that matched you. So, well, thank you so much, Chris, and I really appreciate, uh, David, all that you're doing with Donate Life America, and I hope that this show will help people be compelled to go and sign up and be an organ donor. So can you give the website one more time before we close? DonateLife.net. All right. It's pretty easy. Well, great. Have a wonderful day. You Thanks a lot. You too. Thanks for listening to Kidney Talk, a program of Renal Support Network. Please make sure to find us on Facebook or sign up for our newsletter at rsnhope.org. 
Kidney Talk is intended for informational purposes only. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment from your physician. Always seek the advice of your own health care provider regarding your medical condition.